now, now, now. I am so glad that we, I, we can see and I can interview the incredible Josh Kornbluth. And we are interviewing Josh Kornbluth like we'd interview him anytime, but specifically tonight because he is doing a show, a solo performance on the weekends at Shotgun Players called Citizen Brain. Hey, hello, Josh. Hi, Stephanie. How's it going? It's good. It's really, really good. Cool. Cool. Things are okay here in Berkeley, too. You know, yeah. everything considered. Did you get a haircut? I got a haircut. I am. Um, it was, you know, I was reaching the point where I had to make a choice of either to get a haircut or to become one of those old guys who like makes a little ponytail with his gray hair behind his bald head. And I wasn't ready for that. I'm not ready for that other identity yet. I don't think I'm hip enough. So I went for a haircut, but it was totally, uh, it was very uh, COVID safe. Really? How do you know? Well, that, that's what they told me. I mean, it was just a guy <laughs> out in the street, but... Um, <laughs> And he, I think that's what he said. He was coughing a lot. Um, but anyhow, I think it, I, I, I'm, I'm sure it'll, it was fine. Well, it's been over two weeks, I think, hasn't it? It has. It's, it's weird, you know, because we, you know, you and I both were in such a rhythm of the weekly bingo game. And I feel like I, I was getting close to finally mastering the bingo strategies, you know. So I'm looking forward to picking that up again. You know, we are too. And you know, sometimes when you take a break, even though you don't think you're doing it, your mind, your mind, which you, I know you know a lot about, is subconsciously working on it, right? And so when you come back, your bingo is going to be bingo, bingo. Yeah, I think, you know, probably I'm going to be a, like Josh Bingo Host 2.0, and I'll probably not mess up so much on the numbers and the letters and, and things. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to making that big leap. The big leap back to bingo. Back to bingo, but then better bingo. Back to better bingo. Maybe we yeah. have to change the name of it. We have to call it Josh Cornbluth hosts better bingo. Well, that's that's making a promise there, you know, because then it, it has to. Then we have to be better. This is totally not related to anything, but Stephanie, did you ever play, you know, the chicken in Chinatown that plays tic-tac-toe? Did you ever play tic-tac-toe against that chicken? I did I'm just not. thinking of games of strategy. <laughs> so it, was, it was down in, uh, you know, on Mott Street in Chinatown in, in Manhattan. And it was for years, there was a chicken that would, it was like in a, um, like a, an arcade. It was like in a, you know, a thing you put in like a quarter or whatever. And then you had a thing on the outside where you, you know, it's a tic-tac-toe thing and you would like pick something, except the the trick was that the, the chicken always got to go first. So so the chicken always won or tied. And um it was it was a smart chicken. I tried my best. But anyhow, it was this chicken that played you in tic-tac-toe. And how often do you get to do that with other members of the animal kingdom to play a game like that? Are you suggesting that we change bingo into the chicken tic-tac-toe? I think I, I think we should do it in a heartbeat if we could find another genius chicken. You know, you can't just pick a chicken out of the chicken mill. <laughs> Where do chickens live? Coop. They live in a chicken coop. You can't just pick <laughs> a chicken out of a chicken coop and say, you're on, man. Play, or ma'am, I guess. Play, play, some, play some bingo. I don't know. We seem to be going far afield, Stephanie. But I, I just, what I mean to say is I tried my hardest to beat the chicken. And... Uh, but the chicken went first. And so that's like a big advantage. I see. I understand. I'm sorry. You mean, I'm sorry. You never beat the chicken. I do. Oh, I someone, am. someone in, in Nettie or Net in, in says uh, she saw that chicken at the Texas State Fair and couldn't beat it. The same chicken? Uh, well, see, I, I don't know. I don't know because, um, you know, they might, they might disguise one of the chicken they might have disguised one of the chickens so that it looked like the same chicken i don't know 
All right, all right. So I, I'm looking at some things and I, I wanna be clear that Stephanie's Mars Stream is an interview show and always has been since day one. But we do, we will see a short performance eventually from Josh. So for those of you who are wondering, let me tell you this. Okay, but let's, so let's get to the business at hand. Um, you are doing a performance at Shotgun. It is called- Well, I'm doing it for Shotgun. I'm doing it right here in my apartment in Berkeley. But yes, it is a, it is a Shotgun Players production. And you're that doing it was, at home. Zoom I'm doing it at home. home. Yeah, you won't believe it, but there's been this pandemic, and it just it you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have felt it, but it, it's affected a lot of theaters, uh, just you know in terms of how they operate. And so, uh, and this was booked into their season uh, to play at the Ashby Stage at their beautiful theater, uh, but um, but now we're doing it over Zoom. So it's uh, yeah, it's just me. I perform to the computer. And I, I just have faith that there are people who are watching and listening to me. So tell me. It's, it's, I don't get any that, feedback until afterwards. So what has that been like for you? Well, it, it was sort of weird. It took some getting used to. Um, there's some point where I clicked in uh, when we were doing previews. And uh, uh, there was a show, I think my director, Casey Stengel, she said, um, she gave me this note about my previous shit. She said, uh, she said, I forget what she said, but it was really smart. <laughs> and it, oh yeah, she said, I was saying, I feel like I'm always in close up, you know, like, cause that's what I'm doing. It's like an hour and 15 minutes, an hour, 20 minutes. And I'm in close up the entire time. I'm like this, you know, and, and, and I just felt like everything is sort of micro observed, you know? And so I was like, well, I don't know if I can drink coffee or you know what and then she just said basically you be you boo you know like just be you so I was just me so now I'm just me into the computer but it, it it's it's almost like uh uh it's like a a, a a a torture device for someone like me and like many other performers who are or have been at the marsh because we thrive on audience feedback you know and uh and this is zero audience feedback, but I had a lot of feedback when I was developing the show, including at the Marsh. So that's that's why I can do it. So it's not the same experience because you don't have the audience feedback immediately. I don't have it, yeah. I mean, yes, I just, I'm looking at my computer screen. I'm performing from my computer screen and and then I that's it, you know, uh, until afterwards. And then I, I do a talk back, I, I have, after each show, I'm, I'm interviewing brain experts and uh, and then people and people are apparently chatting people. It's like a weird technical thing. Well, you it's not weird to you. You're all an old hand at this now, but people are watching it on YouTube. I'm doing it on Zoom and they're watching it on YouTube. And so they're commenting on YouTube and stuff. And but I don't see that. So <laughs> I'm just like in this like little solo chamber of isolation. So you are all alone. And, and I think a solo performer comes out to not be alone. Yeah, but I will tell you one thing, Stephanie, and you, you know how I really mean this. This run is the only run in which I'm guaranteed not to see anyone in the audience fall asleep while I'm telling my story. <laughs> and, and that's awesome. It's just awesome, you know, to deal... I mean, you know what it's like, you know, people get sleepy and you sort of have to deal with that. And usually they've chosen the first few rows in the center where they're hit by the light and then they, you see them sort of nodding over. And so then you try to like, I don't know if you try to do this when you perform, but I try to do plosives in the direction of the sleeping people, you go up, you know, like that. So it's like, I literally try to wake them up with a puff of, of air and stuff. Um, yeah, so I don't, that's the one positive. Really, I think everything else about not having a live audience is is negative. But I'm really glad I can do this show. And I'm glad you can do it because I experienced it on Sunday night and it mm -hmm. was wonderful. You know, and you. you know, you started these, how long did you do the improvs for this show at the Marsh? It's for a long oh, time. Oh, years, yeah. Like, cause I started pretty, like pretty soon after I began as a fellow at the Global Brain Health Institute. Do you want and to tell then, people, you want to back up Josh and explain what you're talking about? Just talk a little bit. Okay, so um, in 
the fall of 2016, I uh, wrote an email to this guy named Dr. Bruce Miller, uh, who's the director of the Memory and Aging Center at UCSF. And I was writing to him because I had heard through two friends of mine, one of whom being Jeff Hoyle, uh, the great clown, of course. And uh, I had heard from two friends that they'd both been, uh, they had a visiting artist program at this brain place. And my stepfather, uh, who I adored, uh, had just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And, and so I thought this would be a cool gig for me to get. I could like learn about dementia, maybe help him out, help out my stepfather and my mom and, and stuff like that. So so anyhow, so I went there to talk with Bruce and then and Bruce Miller, and then he told me that they were just starting this new amazing thing called the Global Brain Health Institute, and it's um, it's it's a, you become a fellow there. Uh, I I think of this language as being unduly gendered, by the way, but I'm I'm still going with it while I go with it. You become a fellow, and then you're there for a year. And you, they immerse you, you just are immersed in brain science and brain health. So like you go to, I sat in with people with brain diseases being told what it was that they had uh, with their family members and caregivers with them. I, I sat in on, on, on tests of people, you know, cognitive tests and stuff like the kind that, you know, that apparently Donald Trump did really well on his test. Uh, apparently, the one that was man woman photograph. What was it? Camera man woman. Anyhow, it test. You remember you you saw that. You didn't miss that, right? This no, no, so I didn't miss it. But do you do the same test at your brain institute? I just observe the these tests, you know, and you know, it's never. No one ever actually said man woman camera, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah. They have these tests and they're really interesting because they have you do like stuff like this. Like they have you do this and they can find out all that stuff about that. Well, you see, we can do that. So we that rules out you and me having a whole bunch of kinds of, of brain disease. Um, in case any any of anyone in the audience is wondering. Yeah. So, yeah. And so it's amazing. And, and I get to go in and talk to people and ask people, ask brain scientists things. And uh, and so and then um, and you take classes which are called didactics uh, for some reason. And then uh, you also uh, uh, work on a, a project called a pilot project that you work on for the year and it's supposed to like sort of change the world. So you, you, you present it at the end of the year and then some of them get accepted for funding. So basically it was just like being thrown and it's full time for a year, it's full time and it, has, it comes with a stipend, you know, and they apologize for how small the stipend was, but it was of course, more than I had ever made as a theater performer in a year. So um, so I grudgingly accepted their their small offer, though so I was vaguely insulted. So anyhow, and it's changed my life. And, and, and I started in kind of the premise of the piece of Citizen Brain is that I, I started my fellowship at the exact same time as Donald Trump was starting his presidency. And so I, I was thinking about two things really hard. And one was, you know, this idiot fascist who had be, who is now president. And then, uh, and then the other thing was brain, brain disease like dementias. And so it sort of went together. And so pretty early on, I think when I, even when I did my very first improv at the Marsh, I think it was like in March of that year, maybe um, I had, you know, even by then I sort of made this connection. Like, I feel like our collective brain, you know, or what I call the citizen brain has dementia. That, that was my thesis, that our citizen brain has dementia. And, and I thought maybe we have a, a, a better chance of, of curing it within our lifetime, you know, than the scientists do, but I hope they both get cured. So yeah, so that's been my life. My life has been, and then I got it extended for a year. And now I, I still actually am connected with GBHI. I'm making these videos also called Citizen Brain because for some reason I'm just calling everything Citizen. It's Sarah and I aren't having any more children, but if we did, I'd probably name them Citizen Brain. I just <laughs> I, I just have gone to that the time in my life where I call everything Citizen Brain. So anyhow, I have these videos called Citizen Brain, uh, which were my pilot project. And, uh, and those continue. I'm, I have a video that's gonna come out shortly about othering and belonging. Um, Can I interrupt you for a second? I want you to know that my sister 
who teaches philosophy in Chicago, uses your uses it as part of her class. No yeah. way, no way. Say way, say way, way say way, way. Way, way, She says okay, she- Okay, well, that's way, cool. Way, way, way. She uses it in her class. In her classes. Her in philosophy her classes, and, classes. I don't remember oh, which- philosophy, one. so it's, it's not like derangement syndrome class or anything, it's philosophy. Philosophy, Wait, my videos? ethics. ethics. Oh, that's awesome. That's that's really cool. I mean, this makes this this whole interview worth it for me. That was really great. It would have well, been anyhow. But. We're, since we're on my sister, she also told me to tell you that she's rereading Marx and you have to look back. Your people have to look at empathy again. But that's my like, people beating Marxists. Right. That she's rereading Marx. <laughs> and that empathy no. is a different has a has a uh, that. Yeah. But anyway, that gives away too much of the story. I don't, I don't, I don't really remember from my readings of Marx that empathy really jumped out as one of his major themes, you know? He, That's what she said, but she says she's rereading it and she's finding yeah. it. Well, but then, yeah, now I'm thinking about it too. So you could say that's motivated by empathy for the workers, empathy for the oppressed. And that's a huge empathic thing. It's just, God forbid you were a Trotskyite and then Mar Marx would have no part of you, but if, if you were a worker, you are cool. And and if you were a factory, the son of a factory owner like Engels, uh, Marx would also be happy to hang out with you as well. So anyway, please go on. I interrupted your flow. Oh. Well, I'm just, no, I, I don't really have a flow or anything, but I just, uh, I noticed that, so Robin uh, Moss, you write that uh, your husband, Adam Wasco, uh, says hello. So say hi to Adam for me, Adam is incredible. Adam and I were uh, in the first cohort, as they called it. So we we started about the same time. Ad Adam's thing was to um, train dogs to help people with memory problems. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. I mean, you would you're a, the total dog person. So like you you would get how cool that is. It's so cool. You know, like people, they're dogs that are helpers for people who have mobility problems or people who have vis you know visibility you know whatever vision problems or whatever this is for people with memory problems so i i, so I haven't he, been there do you know what he exactly trained them to do by any chance do you remember no not really because we mostly talked about sports and and that that was a shame really before he left no um <laughs> no but it's really cool i mean if you can think of like you know like if you like, where did I put my keys? And then you like look over at your schnauzer and your schnauzer goes, Rello, we root your rees, Rover rare, Rosh. That I, I'm, I'm just, that's the way the Jetsons dog talks. So I just assume actual dogs talk that way. Beginning I can tell you that my dogs don't talk that way, but they're not yeah. Jetson dogs. They're not, no, no. So anyhow, yeah. So Adam was with me and, and um, we were among the few because there, there's like, there were maybe 12 of us, I think 12 of us. And oh, and, and GBHI is half of it is at uh, UCSF at the Memory and Aging Center. And half of it is at Trinity College, Dublin. So you had 12, about 12 fellows in each place. And then we would, and that was the first time I used Zoom. That was, it was, uh, you know, because we were in different countries and stuff like that. So it was anyhow, like prescient, prescient of your time now. It, it, was, it was quite prescient, yes. So yeah, so it's been amazing and it changed my life. And then I started, as I always do, improvising with audiences. And as I frequently do improvising, I started improvising with audiences at the Marsh. And when I improvise, as you know, I just like start by just talking about something with just this idea, like I'm gonna talk about this brain place I'm at, you know, and, um, and then see what happens. And then one of the things that happened at the Marsh, when I think we were doing it every other month, or something um, in improv. and But one of the things that happened is I hadn't planned on it. I had planned on just talking about being at the brain place at UCSF, but I ended up starting to talk about my stepfather and my mom. And so that became another story within this piece. And um, um, and so there were the, like these two sort of parallel stories of, of my, my, my stepfather, Frank, um, Having having dementia and my mom trying to deal with it and me trying to help her, 
and then me learning all about brain stuff in the brain place. So cool. It's such a good story. And it's really gone far from those Marsh days. It's very clean and clear and brilliant, Josh. You did a well, great freaking job. Thanks. You know, and, and well, you, you know a ton about this process as well, but I had sort of taken as far as I could take it. I did a bunch of improvs at the Marsh. I did a few more improvs uh, when um, um, the Shotgun Players booked me. Uh, I did a few more improvs, but then I start, as I always do, I started working with the, the collaborators. Uh, and um, I've had a run of collaborators named David. So I thought I would change things up a little bit. So my collaborators are named uh, Casey and Aaron in this case. And, and it's because of them, essentially. It's been this amazing experience where we started, you know, working together. They would fly up from LA and then we would, you know, do improvs in front of people. But then the last improv that we did was right before COVID shut everything down. So then we continue doing our meetings and rehearsals and stuff over Zoom. And so I'd be in Berkeley and then they'd be in LA and then Aaron moved his family to London. So so we've been in in, in those three places, including London. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's incredible. But, you know, Aaron would like, they would, Aaron and Casey would talk to me about, well, Josh, you know, in drama, like <laughs> it's supposed to like have some sort of a forward motion <laughs> to it. And I say, you know, I have heard about that. I have heard about <laughs> character development. I have heard the term. I've heard about a narrative arc, you know, but I, I sort of have, it's a problem because, you know, in, um, as I vaguely understand it in an actual play, which is what I endeavor to do, even though it's just me, but in a play that the, the protagonist faces obstacles and then and then reaches this destination you know I think I read that at least so um but the thing is with me is that so far in my monologues I've kind of ended up the same as I started because that's who I am and so this was a different thing because I really was trying to what I'm trying to do I'm trying to sort of uh to grow as as a performer and as a, as a writer and um, and to do it in the to take advantage of the fact that I was developing this piece to do it and knowing that audiences, you know, what, what I learned early on was that audiences are brilliant audiences are geniuses so there's never any problem of being like too good for an audience, you know, it's just like trying to get up to that so and the other thing that was that was um, a big deal and that you know Casey and Aaron helped me work through and that I resisted a lot was it was I, I talk a lot about my mom I actually forced myself to hardly, I'd mentioned my father once. And usually, as you know, my pieces uh, heavily involved my father because my father was this big guy running around naked and wearing talcum powder and singing the International and, and, and using, you know, four letter words and stuff and joyfully. And, uh, and my mom was really different. My mom's really different. And so it was a real challenge for me, like now to, to try to do a show that was actually centered around my mom. Um, my, we've had a troubled relationship, my mother and I, um, I doubt that you or anyone would be able to relate to that, uh, having any difficulties with uh, one's own mother. Uh, certainly my understanding of, of Sigmund Freud is that he said, mothers are always right. So I don't know. I think it's just me, but anyhow, we're, we're working through it. And so I don't, my mom hasn't seen it yet. Um, she hasn't. But she actually, she actually can, you know, because people can see it now. People can see it. People have watched it in Turkey, in Turkey, you know, where I'm developing a following of that person in Turkey. Um, Maybe you can do a Turkey tic-tac-toe. Oh, yeah. But turkeys, are turkeys really as smart as chickens? Really? I don't know. I have to look into that. But yeah. So um, anyhow, yeah, it's, it's been amazing. It's been an amazing experience. And then so then and then it was like, well, are we going to do a show at all because of COVID, stuff like that? And also because of our, our country possibly imminently slipping into fascism and, you know, just and the and the earth melting and, you know, things like that. There seemed like there was a lot going on that was more important than whether my show would happen. But um, one thing that also happened is that once uh, the people at Shotgun, Patrick Dooley and the others said, no, we're really going to do this show. We're going to do this show. We're figuring out how to do it. We're going to do it online and stuff. And then I started improvising with audiences uh, online over Zoom. And in that situation, I could see the audience. I couldn't hear them, but I could see them. 
So I did get feedback and then I got feedback afterwards. But as we developed it, it became really clear to me right away because we had taken this break during the COVID thing for months. And then when I started improvising again, not having improvised for like months, I realized that like the piece had to address what it is that we're going through right now. Like where it had to address why it is that I was speaking to my audience this way rather than with them, you know? And, um, and then also it had to deal with, um, it had to deal with anti-racism. It had to deal with, you know, this, you know, this, this struggle to, uh, you know, this struggle to uh, try to defeat metastasize uh, white supremacy in this country. And so, um, so yeah, so those things had to be in it and it, it ended up in, and they are, but it ended up in, like, it fits in perfectly with everything else. It's as if the piece that I was working at the Marsh years ago was actually in preparation for when we would be, you know, sheltering in place uh, because of a pandemic and fighting fascism. So it's magical. This but magical the collaborator, it was really cool. The collaborators were really cool. They're really hard on me. It was like, <laughs> I had these stories. How did I you really find liked. them? How did you find Casey? What made you choose Casey and Aaron? Did they, how, how did they, what did Casey do? What did Aaron do? Did they both direct? What, you know, what was it? Casey, Casey is my director and Aaron is a dramaturg. Um, and uh, I found them because of Aaron's sister, Gwen, Gwen Loeb, who is among other brilliant things, an actress and friend of mine. And I said, I, I need to find someone because my, the guy I had collaborated with for 20 years, uh, David Dower, um, I guess, you know, he made the decision that sometimes people do not to make me the center of his life. And, uh, and so I had to move on. Like he had, he had his whole other life and work, although he has a granddaughter in the East Bay. So I still get to see him, but anyhow, I need a new collaborator. And that's really, who would collaborate with me? Who would, you know, I mean, how could it work? You know, it has to be someone who can, you know, <laughs> tell me to shut up, you know? And, um, but also teach me stuff because just telling me to shut up, I could just pay, you know, I mean, that's why I pay the dominatrix for next door. So, yeah. And that's different. Usually director and dominatrix, there's different straps and stuff that are, I'm getting, this is really going, um, this is, I'm, I've, I'm, I've said too much, Nor but yeah. Said, and so, so I asked Gwen and then she recommended, she knew a number of directors, but she recommended Casey Stangles. This uh, director is really great. She's directed, all over the country, including at ACT and stuff like that. She's based in LA. And then um, and then Gwen recommended her brother, Aaron, who I knew from the Y, from the downtown Berkeley Y. Uh, also his plays, he's a playwright. And I don't know if people watching have seen, but he's a really, really great playwright. Also, by coincidence, although this has nothing to do with my show, but it has to do with why Aaron and his family are in London. Now, Aaron is a video game mogul. He is like a super high powered, like, so we would have, when we were having rehearsals in Berkeley, you'd say, got to go to Apple, got to talk to, you know, those top guy people, and I'll be back in a half hour, you know, stuff like, I mean, he's, so he's like this, this, this big deal in that business. Um, and he's, he's so damn smart. And so it's really cool. So, you know, the, I never really had a separate dramaturg to develop a show before. And, and it's really cool. Cause you know, he, he would focus on, you know, the structure of the show. You know, uh, Casey did too, but Aaron especially. You know, and he would say, well, you know, you have a bunch of stories. Well, Casey would say that too. They would say it to me. They would sit me down. They wouldn't strap me in or anything, but they would sit me down and then they would say, well, Josh, you have a bunch of stories, but is that is that really a piece? You know, and <laughs> that is what you call a rhetorical <laughs> question when it's coming from a director and a dramaturg that you're working with. And so I'd say, I'm guessing by your tone that it is not a piece. and. And so how to make it a piece? How do I make it a piece? And I had all these stories that I loved, right? That I developed at the Mart. I had one story that I did not want to give up. I didn't want to give up uh, that I did in improvs, a story about uh, this guy who had this really bad brain disease, who I sat in on him being tested by a nurse. And he seemed to be like Donald Trump, almost exactly like Donald Trump, but he, he, you know, he wasn't Donald Trump, but anyhow, and I had that story and I really wanted to tell it because, and it ended with this thing about empathy. You know, it ended with this thing about how I'm able to figure out, I was able to figure, I was able to empathize with him. I can't empathize with Trump. So 
don't even let's not go there. I just I just want the bastard to, to to be really sick in jail for a long time and drop the soap. So but this guy, I could tell it was like it was his brain. When I realized it was his brain that was making him be a jerk to the nurse. Um, and that wasn't him. And so I had this empathy for him. So it was it used to be the end of my improv would be this beautiful vision that I had of everyone empathizing with everyone else and leading, you know, me leading this empathy revolution. And then at some point, especially after the COVID thing, well, not after the COVID thing, but really uh, George Floyd. Um, it was, it's just, it was impossible if it had been possible before to try to advocate for everyone empathizing with everyone else, which I believe we should all try to do. Um, but to advocate for that as the solution to structural problems like, you know, racism, structural racism and inequality and so, and you can't anymore. Like you, you couldn't anymore in this time. I don't believe I, I could have, and my collaborators couldn't either. We couldn't leave audiences thinking, yeah, so now we all empathize and man, you know, we empathize with those poor suffering people oh, wow, that means we're really cool, right? We're really evolved. <laughs> and then everyone leaves the theater and you're happy. I mean, I like when people leave the theater and they're happy, but but it was a thing I was like, but it isn't true. So then we had to figure out, I had to figure out like, well, what do I think is true? Like what, what kind of revolution do I want? You know, if it isn't purely an empathy revolution. And, um, and so this piece is in part about finding that out um, or, you know, trying to figure it out while I'm learning about- <laughs> brain science and brain science helping me did you figure did that it all out? make sense that, 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 that i think that was all pretty linear right that made sense very 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 yeah. very no linear in a non-linear way oh well, all right thank you i think but to so, be yeah. linear here josh to be okay linear, okay did you figure it out i figured out what i believe and by the end of the show my character has expressed that. And uh, I can't say, I'm sort of mixed because then if I'm right, then I told people right now, and then it would help people to, you know, have this revolution that results in all of us being happy. It'd be weird for me to withhold it because I'd want people to see my show, right? Especially for like a, a socialist to do that, right? But if you're a broke ass socialist during a pandemic, maybe it starts to be forgivable. So that's what I'm saying. But there's other things, there's other things that um, you're not gonna, I don't think, uh, and I don't think trying to empathize uh, with, uh, what's his name, Mitch, whatever, the guy who looks like a, a McConnell, turtle. McConnell, Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell. Oh, have you seen him? He's he's turning back into Voldemort. Have you have you seen his hands? If you have you, and in his face too. He's he's like Voldemorting. He's like molting or on whatever the opposite of molting is. But I, I mean, like I. That's just there. Just some people are just so damn evil. More than I thought there were in our country, and um, yeah. I guess I'm Star Wars. Him. Star Wars was right. Meanwhile, Josh, before we go any farther, would you like to now do a section of your incredible citizen brain for us? Well, I, yeah, I thought maybe I'd do the beginning because it's hard for me to do excerpts from any of my shows, anything except the beginnings, because you would need to know what happened before in order to understand that, you know what I mean? So I, I think well the, beginning, the, the beginning is perfect. Perfect. Plus... You happen to mention to me in your very nice, uh, 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 your very nice text to me that you had missed the beginning, and and so so this is a chance for me to do the beginning for you. You are so, so nice. Thank you, Josh. I am. You know, it's 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 weird. Sometimes people do mellow with age. That's for sure. The beginning of this is sort of the beginning of Citizen Brain. So here we are online together and I'm talking to you on Zoom and we're all sheltering in place during a raging pandemic. And to me, really there's two contagions going on. One of them started relatively recently and that of course is the coronavirus. And the other one has been around for hundreds of years and, and, and that's white supremacy. 
Meanwhile, out on the streets, there's a revolution happening, an actual revolution. Uh, people are coming out still day after day, night after night. They're coming out in Portland, Oregon, and in Louisville, and in New York, and elsewhere. There's all this revolution happening all around us. And that's what's weird about that is that this should be my time. Because I've been a storyteller for 30 years, and all my monologues in some way have been about revolution. Revolution is my thing. Revolution is my Revolutions are us. Like, for example, my first show was called Red Diaper Baby. It opened in 1992, and it began, here's how it began. My father, Paul Kornbluth, was a communist. He believed there was going to be a violent communist revolution in this country, and that I was going to lead it just so you get a sense of the pressure. Okay, that's the opening of Red Diaper Baby. Since 1992, I performed it, conservatively speaking, 92 quadrillion times. And I've remained, as we were talking about Stephanie, I've remained quite steeped in the, in the works of Marx. For example, I have read all four volumes of Das Kapital, even though there are only three volumes of Das Kapital. That's, that's how deep inside this stuff I've been. So I should be all set to lead this revolution, right? And I should be all set to tell, tell you about it. But at this time in my life, I've arrived at a new understanding of revolution. And the way I got there was through the study of brain science. It all started in the fall of 2016, by which point I'd pretty much given up on revolution. I mean, capitalism had won and Hillary was certainly gonna win and we'd all continue to live comfortably in our neoliberal utopia. And then something terrible happened to my mom, Bunny. And you, you have to understand something. My mother had never been in love. Certainly not with my father. They divorced when I was a baby. But the one thing they had in common was the ironclad belief that I, their ungainly, socially awkward son, would lead the revolution that had been predicted by the infallible science of Marxism-Leninism. And usually, as we spoke of, Stephanie, usually in my monologues, I talk a lot about my dad. And I rarely talk about my mom. And now I'm, I'm going to tell you one story about my mother and, and perhaps you'll begin to understand why. My mother, Bunny, was a librarian, but she aspired to be a published writer. And one night when I was like five or six, this fire broke out in the apartment right next to ours in, in our tenement building in Manhattan. And this it raged through the apartment, this fire in the apartment next to us, and it, it hollowed it out. The two young women who lived in that apartment barely escaped with their lives and with their cat. And, and, and then, and, 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 even though the fire didn't get to our apartment, even after the fire was over, there was still on the ceiling, on our ceiling in the foyer, on the ceiling, there were like these singe marks from the fire from next door. So the, my memory of that fire afterwards was still really palpable. And, and that's when my mom decided to sit me down and tell me something. She said, Joshi, if we ever have a fire like that in our apartment, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rescue my manuscript and then I'm gonna come back for you. And honestly, I was, I mean, I was just happy to be in the top five. But I think you can tell from that story, my mom, not, not, not a, a person who exudes warmth, not a huggy, touchy feely sort of person. And um, so it probably makes sense to you thinking, knowing that my mother never fell in love. And my, my mom had plenty of boyfriends throughout her life. I mean, she was then, as she still is now, as she approaches her 92nd birthday, my mother's very beautiful and had no trouble getting boyfriends, but it was never love, it was never love. And you know, you get to a certain time in your life and you think, well, maybe some of the things that I've wished for will not happen. And one of the things I'd wished for my whole life was for my mother to fall in love. And I thought, okay, I guess it's not gonna happen. And then when my mom was in her late seventies, a man named Frank Rosen came into her life. Frank was a retired union organizer and an electrician. In fact, he was an organizer with the United Electrical Workers, the UE, really incredible union. Uh, and like my mom, Frank was a communist. So Frank lived in Chicago and his loving wife, uh, communist wife, Lois Ann, uh, tragically uh, was diagnosed with a cancer and it moved very quickly and, and Lois Ann died. And after a suitable period of mourning, Frank decided that he, you know, he's one of those people who needs to have a partner and being Frank Rosen, he needed to have a communist partner. So Frank went around Chicago looking for a suitable communist woman, you know, to, to be his new partner. And none of the women he met 
he felt were up to snuff. So Frank went bigger. He placed a personals ad in the Nation magazine. You know, communist widower, mid 80s, seeks communist woman, 70 to 140 for a long term relationship and hopefully marriage. And and he was flooded with responses. Frank was just inundated with responses. It turns out, at least at that point, that if you're a communist widower, it's a seller's market. So now he has all these responses from these communist women from all around the United States. And he picked to him the top five, the top five finalists, including my mom. And to these finalists, Frank sent out essentially an exam, uh, a test. It was um, 11 and a half single space pages. And it, it, it was essentially a test to determine in granular detail what their communist doctrine was, just the very fine points of their communist doctrine. So we sent out this test to the five women and my mother aced it. And not only the multiple choice, but also the essay questions, which were very hard and, and were graded on a curve. So now my mom was the chosen one and now it was time for them to meet in person, Frank, a Chicago and my mother, a New Yorker. She'd never left New York to that point. So first Frank came to New York to see my mom and he hated New York, but he really liked my mom. And then my mom visited Frank in Chicago and she actually dug Chicago and she really, really dug Frank. And they fell in love. They fell in love. It was incredible. My mother was in love. And she moved to Chicago and moved in with Frank and they got married. And um, just in case you're hearing this story and you're thinking, oh, their love probably wasn't as deep as you're saying, Josh, you know, just in case you're doubting the depth of their love, let me, let me tell you this. In order for my mom to move to Chicago, to move in with Frank, my mother had to give up her rent control department on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Okay, so, I mean, don't give me your Romeo and Juliet. That is weak sauce, romance-wise, compared to Frank and Bunny. So they moved into this beautiful apartment in this high rise on the south side of Chicago. They had picture windows overlooking uh, overlooking uh, Lake Michigan. And when my wife and son and I would visit them, it was just amazing to see my mother doting on someone. And he, in turn, was doting on her. They were doing like mutual doting. And then, and then get this too, because they happened to be near the University of Chicago, my mom got the idea that what the hey, she'd submit her manuscript to the U University of Chicago Press, and she did, and it was accepted. So it's, it's a communist fairy tale. And I was so happy for my mom. Of course I was, but it did occur to me for my whole life, she never seemed to truly need anyone, including me. But now here was Frank and, and he was who she needed. And now this is when that, that terrible thing happened. Frank got sick, I think it was a flu, and he recovered from the flu, but when he came back from the flu, he never, Frank never returned to his full frankness, his full Frank self, his full Frankosity. He had been so dynamic before he got sick. I mean, you wouldn't know he was retired as a union organizer. He was always on the phone and on the treadmill while he was on the phone and, and always moving, moving, moving. But now, now he would just was content to just sit there, just sit on the couch. And, and he, he was having memory lapses and he was getting paranoid in these weird ways. And in due course, they brought Frank in to the doctor and he, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And my mother would never let on that she needed my help but she did. And I knew that my mom needed help because I was getting regular reports from Frank's son. Frank's son, Carl, is also a union organizer. And weirdly, since Carl is, of course, a red diaper baby like me, it's just weird to me that it, his name is spelled with a C. It's Carl with a C. And I should ask him at some point. But Carl would call and say, it's just getting worse and worse. I'm really worried for them, Josh. And I'm sitting here in the Bay Area thinking I, I have to help but how can I be of service? Which is how I found myself in the office of Dr. Bruce Miller at UCSF's Memory and Aging Center, thinking I was applying for a job as a visiting artist. Was that, is that a good length? Are you still there? I'm here. Okay, cool. Sorry, had to unmute and, uh, and re-video. Yeah. That's a good length and as Net, Nettie, or Net, Nettie Goldud says it's perfect. You're Thank perfect. You. That's, that's very sweet. Thank you. 
So yes, and so right, and that's the first however many minutes of the show. I think it's like ten, nine or ten minutes you did. So it's what you asked me to do, which is strange because usually when I'm asked to do a ten minute excerpt, I do like a ninety minute excerpt. So I, I think you're good. an entirely changed person, Josh. This um, whole show, my shortest show previously was Haiku Tunnel maybe the moisture seekers, but they were about 85 minutes long. That was my shortest I could ever get a show. And this show is 75 minutes long, which is cool because apparently people, I, well, I do find this, I don't know if you do, but I, it, it's harder to stay focused on Zoom, you know, on a screen than it is sometimes in person. Um, also, if you're in a theater and you're seeing someone live, it's hard to leave without embarrassing yourself or feeling embarrassed, but when people are on, on this, like right now, they can be clicking off or, or just, they can even have their cameras still on, but be watching, you know, reading a, a, a Twitter or something like that. So there's a lot of ways to lose people's attention uh, in, the, in this way of communicating. So it's cool that, but it just ended up being 75 minutes long, but it, um, yeah, yeah. So we saw approximately one seventh of it. I'm sorry, what? We've what? Seen oh, exactly. you're doing the math, Stephanie. Yeah. That's so cool. You're doing the math. That's so why 10 I, out of I'm 70, really... 10 out of 75, 10 over 75. Okay. So that's the same as five over what 75 divided by five. No, two. That's five. But what, what's seven, 30? No, that's the wrong thing to have done. It, 10 over 75 is like two over five and over 13. No, what's, what's. Okay. I, I, I'm maybe 13. Maybe it's two thirteenths of the show. Two thirteenth. If, if David Fuchs is still watching, I think David or Cynthia. David, was that correct? Was that correct? No. One. What? One. One. Eleven. Five. Five. Three. One. Five. Three. I need semaphore. I need. I need you to use semaphore, David. He's trying to indicate to me with a thing over. He's doing the whole fraction thing. I don't know if you guys can see him. You see him. I doing can this? see him. He's there, but could he just write it in the chat, David? Could you? No, write no, that's it too easy. Chat? No, that's too easy. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, wait. So wait, wait. No, I have a calculator app. I do. Although I have to say, much more fun to have coffee with David Fuchs than with my calculator app. But here is the calculator app. So what do we say? Ten minutes divided by seventy-five. Nine minutes. Nine minutes. You did nine, nine minutes. minutes. Okay, make me do that. Sure, sure. Why not? Nine yeah. divided by seventy-five, and so that was. Oh my god! I don't know. It says zero point zero one four eight one four eight one four eight one four eight. I think we. I think I think what I've done is I've created in this in this excerpt an imaginary number that mathematicians will be working on for years. Yes. But yeah. there's more, so they're, they're, they're another 65 minutes or 66 minutes. <laughs> and I will hate to be wrong when I came up with a bad math quotient since I tried it, I think of myself as being pretty good. But let's go on because that would be a different show called The Mathematics of Change. And the here we that, are at yeah. Citizen Brain. Okay, uh, Nettie, Nettie says 9.75 is 12% or one eighth. See, if Ms. Gedold had been around for my entire life, I would have had so many questions answered that I'm still searching for after 61 years. And Sarah Sunstein, okay. I'm sorry, you came in second, so you get the you get the turkey that can't play tic tac toe, but Nettie gets the chicken that can. That's <laughs> all right. So, so there you have it, and we hear we we hear about your mother, Bunny, right? Her name is Bunny, but she's not fuzzy and warm. This Bunny, <laughs> how'd she true. get that name? How'd and she get that name? And I, I, as her son, I, I don't feel qualified to say whether or not she's bushy tailed, but. Uh, She's, she, that was, you know, they would name things like that when she was, a, a, that was a name, her name is Bernice, but she was known as Bunny and her older sister was named Birdie. So it was Bunny and Birdie, but my grandfather, their father always called Birdie Florence. He called, so <laughs> it was Bunny and Birdie. But grandpa called them bunny and bubbles. He called my mom bubbles and he called Bertie Florence. 
And it has been explained to me by Jews even older than I am, which is incredible that Florence would be from their from her Jewish name. Would be a what? That Florence is like her Jewish name or it's a translation of her Jew. I don't remember. Or maybe it was because they were traveling in Italy. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you've got the show. You're doing it at Shotgun, right? Yes. You've heard well, the first yes. 12%. I, I've done now 12% of the show. And so people can get, you can try to get 12% off the ticket. And since it's sliding scale, I think you can actually do that. Yes, you can. You could yeah. do that. So... Never mind. Let's not have any more math conversations. So, Don't. so, so, Fantastic. you've got, you know, you've got the show, right? So, do you have a part two to the show? Are you working on another show? So, two things: Are you working on another show, and are you still at the Brain Institute? I just came up with, I just worked super hard for years on this show, and it just opened. And Stephanie, you're saying, oh, well. If you don't have another show, then I, I for one, am disappointed in you, Josh. And, and that, that's hard to that's hard to take. Can I can I just say something? Yes. I'm not asking that question because I have expectations. Okay. I'm as, or, and I'm not disappointed. Or anything. No, I, I actually like knew that. you weren't disappointed. I knew it's you were disappointed. It was just a question. It was just. It was just a, a question. question. It was a simple question. No need for me to get defensive. This is the same conversation I had with my therapist two days ago. So yes. <laughs> and so, no need to make a joke about it. Um, so what were you asking me? Is there another show coming? No, not right now. I'm still, this show is just brand new and it kept evolving as my shows tend to do right up until opening night and probably will evolve a little bit as it continues. Also, it changes a little bit. There's a joke. There are a few jokes in the show, but there's one particular joke that is I leave blank in the sense that I don't know what the joke is until that day, because the, that one joke is based on something that's happening in the news, right? So at the risk of like giving away something that would be cool in the show, but what the, hey, it's a joke about, I'm explaining in the piece, I explain a lot about brain science. So if people are worried that, you know, there won't be a lot of brain science in it, you can rest easy, there's brain science. And one of the things I talk about in brain science, and it's important for my empathy revolution, ultimately, is emotional contagion. Emotional contagion is like an actual thing. Uh, it's an actual neurological term, emotional contagion. And emotional contagion, we all have it. And emotional contagion is why uh, if a baby in the middle of like a newborn baby ward, the hospital starts crying, and then the other babies start crying in the ward, why are the other babies crying? Right. So here's where my joke goes. Right. So last week it was they're they're not. Hey, they're not crying because Rudy Giuliani never got to finish his interview in the hotel room. No, they're crying because of emotional contagion. See, so that that joke changes. And then before that it was they're not crying because they're because they're afraid that the fly that landed on Pence's head caught COVID from him. See, so it's just like it, it's timely. I mean, it's yeah. It's in the moment, in, in, in the moment, investigative. So I don't know. Performance. I don't know what tomorrow, I don't know what this weekend it will be. I don't know what it will be. So you'll be performing it for this weekend and next weekend. Is that correct? Yes. So, and there, there'll be, I think, very different weekends in the sense that one is before the election and one is what I hope is after the election, you know? So, um, and it was booked that way. Uh, Shotgun booked it to be the show that they would have that was running before and then through and after the election. Um, and so one of the things about it was, well, for them, for me, for the audience, to like tell a story that might give us some hope and might keep us from freaking out so much that we're totally incapacitated. So, um, and then people in the audience have been saying it gives them hope, which is beautiful, you know? So there is a question in the chat room. We're coming to the close of our time. It's already 828, but we have a question here. And the question is, if all the dogs in a neighborhood start barking, is that emotional contagion? Okay, we need Adam Wasco here. So I don't know since Adam's clearly not interested enough to watch, but his wife, if she's still, maybe you could, you could ask your husband about that. I will just 
vamp and just guess that what they have is actually technically known as remotional rentagen. Well, actually, Adam is here. He could answer. Adam is here, appearing as Robin, appearing as Robin Moss, which is quite a step up if you know Adam. So Adam, who knows billions of things about dogs and training dogs, is that emotional contagion? If one of the dogs starts barking, the other dogs start barking. Is that, do you use that term? Is that a term of art for dog people? There he is, he's up, he's video. Oh, Can there you, you are. Unmute? Can we unmute, can we unmute Adam? Yeah, there I am. I'm sorry, Josh, okay. I, missed, I missed the first part of your question, my friend. Um, can you repeat that? Yeah, so I so here's the thing. I was just talking about emotional contagion in human beings, which is you know you catch. Well, you took the same classes that I did. You know all about emotional contagion. You tried. So tried. Yes. 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 We 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 <laughs> both absorbed equally as much, didn't we? Yes. <laughs> but anyhow, emotional contagion is you know when you catch an emotion and that's a human mm -hmm. thing, right? It spreads. And then it was asked here: Is there a, a is, when a dog? barks and then other dogs start barking is that also emotional contagion hmm um well then we get into the anthropomorphic kind of thing here um between each other see i think there's emotional contagion um, between animals and humans mm. right for sure so i have to believe that there's emotional contagion between animals as well although i think Certainly, our emotions are deeper than dogs, per se. Adam, I, I never expected you to say that to me. Well, deeper really in the sense that I think there's more complexity to it. Actually, maybe dogs are, have a more pure emotion. Ah. Right? So I think you, it's not a, it's not a judgment call on what is better, because I think we're too complicated. That's <laughs> um, yeah. Right. Speak for but, yourself, but yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do think that you know, there's a thing um, where have you ever seen two dogs behind a fence? And... Have I ever? I, that's my life. No. What do you mean? <laughs> have I seen two dogs and, behind and, a fence? And then a dog. What are you talking pass, about? A dog passes in front of them, and they're. And oh they, yeah, and they start barking. They yes, I have observed. Other dog, that. and then the fence opens up, and they're like, "Okay, it's cool, right?" So there's uh -huh. this sort of thing that happens where they're playing off their emotions, but it's all bluster. So I think that that reminds me of humans do that though. Humans yeah, exactly right. Be really truthful with their emotions, in my experience. Ooh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm hanging out with different humans. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> You're hanging out with better humans. You're also a better cyclist than I am, and I just I want to admit this publicly as well. <laughs> also, um, I have a question for you about if theoretically someone like me and someone like my wife were to have been hosting let's say our son's cat in our apartment during uh, the fires and then the cat left, but then we had a huge flea infestation. What might be the next steps? But, um, mm. but that, that, that's, we, we'll, look, I'll take that off the air. Right, 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 right. And right, what we've been right. doing is vacuuming and, and <laughs> washing everything in washing everything in hot water so everything is the same color and it's all sh shrunk. Right, right, yeah. Well, yeah, I think you have to, you have to invest in flea control for your neighbor's pets. Uh, okay, so okay, this is the last thing, Adam, because then I, I, I really have to get not back to this thing, yes. but it's really great to catch up. My um, so we called a flea service to come over. It didn't work, but we called you know the flea buster. Right, right, right. So yeah. Over. So like we're going, but this place is a mess. We never let like that's people could only see in this frame because other if you see outside the frame, it'll be like you know. I don't know. The emperor uh, has no clothes. Dystopia or something. <laughs> so I spent the night before the guy came over. Like I threw out literally more than a dumpster's worth of stuff just that I happened to find that it turns out I had much things I didn't need. And and I threw it out. So I threw out like a dumpster plus of stuff. And I was really proud of myself. And then I was there and the guy rang the buzzer and he came into our apartment, the flea buster guy. And he, he looked around. The first thing he said is, Man, this place is cluttered. So, Adam, this is this is my life. Yes, yeah. yes. No, it's tough. It's a tough life. Well, it's great to see you, my man. You too. You too, Josh. You too. And um, you know, I think people need to understand how hard you worked around this stuff. Um, you know, it was a, quite a journey, and uh, it's great to see you turn it into uh, something like this that's used in people's classes. I mean, 
My I know, I know. Yes. I, I'm pedagogical. Bruce, Bruce Miller is heartened today. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Bruce. I'll have to let my yeah. sister know. Well, I just have to say one thing about dogs and contagion and emotional. I have three dogs now who are by far the most emotional dogs. And I think it's by breed as anyone else, as any of my dogs, they show their emotion. It's all, I finally understood they're just being emotional. Mm -hmm. So that's not about contagion, but it is about the emotionality of dogs. And also, is let's it, get back. Is it human centric to think that of it as dogs catching emotions from us rather than we catch the emotion from the dog, which is probably just the same. And I even saw Adam in his little rectangle nodding slightly. So I think I might've said something. Well, yes, you know, I suggest you reading Behave by Sapolsky, if you want. I've read Behave, Adam Waskow. I have read <laughs> Behave, the book by Robert Sapolsky of Stanford University yes. thrice. Yes. That's how much I've read it. Well, you need to read it thrice because it's some deep and, stuff, but yes, indeed. And yes. he's incredible. And if you're a Sapolsky fan and yes. who isn't out there, right. he's amazing. But anyhow, he'll be my talkback guest uh, on Saturday for the Halloween. I saw show. that. I saw that. Good catch. Good catch. Congratulations. Oh. All right. Thanks. Okay, Josh. So you're performing this weekend on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Is that correct? Yeah. And that then is correct. Next Friday and Saturday at Seven? I think maybe seven. I'm going to go with seven. And then Friday and Saturday at seven and then Sunday at five. Yeah, that's where I got confused. And then the f the, f the final weekend is the same Friday, Saturday, same and Sunday same, days. Same Friday, Saturday, Sunday, seven, seven, five. You can see Citizen Brain with Josh Kornbluth. And I encourage you all to see it because it is wonderful. It has an incredible story, an incredible performer an incredible message, an incredible emotional contagion. And 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 the critics are saying, uh, among other kind of things, they're saying, don't think you've seen it if you've only seen one ninth of Citizen Brain. <laughs> if you've seen one ninth, you ba barely have seen it at all, is what they're saying in my head. Well, thank you, Josh, for joining me at Stephanie's Marsh Stream. I love having you on. I'm so glad you are here tonight. So and nice I to get to see each other yeah. even without bingo. I know. I mean, this has been the most we've seen each other in years in the, you know, the That's 30 true. years. It's true. Every Friday night, except for these five when you haven't been here or four. But on come Friday, November something. Whatever it is. Six so either, something. yeah. So I'll I'll either be I'll either be accompanied on either side by uh, jackbooted fascists or or else um, we'll have held out a little bit for our, our capitalist democracy. I'm looking forward to hopefully the latter. Right. But yes, we'll I'll be back it. and we'll be playing bingo. And it, don't be don't be intimidated if you've never played bingo. It takes a while. There's a learning curve, but you'll get there. We'll get there. And not only that, Josh is like the best bingo host in the world. He just does amazing stories about Ben Franklin or this or that. And I'm sure I'll have a lot to say about the stream of consciousness bingo hosting hour. Right. Yeah. So a very unusual bingo. So please, everybody, join us. Thank you so much for coming. Thank